Good morning, everyone. Let me introduce you our first speaker for today, Julian Suleda, who talks about medical devices, common vulnerabilities in com uh, medical devices, healthcare, and um, yeah, the stage is yours. Thanks, Thomas, for the introduction. I would like to introduce myself uh, right now. So um, I studied medical informatics, uh, master and bachelor's program in Heidelberg and Heilbronn. It's a cooperative study, so don't wonder why there are two universities uh, in this thing. Um, I wrote my master thesis at the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg and uh, was teaching the IT security lab at Heilbronn University um, for two years. Um, in my free time, I am a member of the special interest group of consumer health informatics in the German Association of um, Medical Informatics, Medical Documentation and Biometry. And there I'm researching in the adoption of wearable technology um, in the population and why people are or aren't using these uh, smart devices, for example. More often there is, of course, the privacy reason, but also because some people think that they are um, relying on their body and the, the natural feedback instead of a fitness tracker telling them that they have to increase their heart rate by two beats per minute because it's better or something like this. Um, I'm a security analyst and researcher at e &W Research and um, the agenda for my talk today is uh, based on a medical visit at your healthcare provider. So basically we are first talking about um, the current state of IT security in healthcare and also about regulations that regulate how um, devices are allowed to be marketed in the European Re Union, but also um, in the US, for example, because these regulations are somehow similar to each other. Then we are doing some diagnostics on um, examples of insecure medical devices I've prepared for you. I will not uh, have a demo because obviously it's too sensitive to show you vulnerabilities in medical devices and having some patients harmed, for example. Afterwards, we will uh, go to the 3 section where we have some recommendations by public authorities, such as the Federal Office for Information Security in Germany, for example, or the FDA, which is responsible uh, in the US. And um, after that, we'll have some uh, short outlook and future, future research done by ENW in these topics. Of course, um, and a disclaimer, because um, if I'm stating names or something, it's not meant to be um, some recommendation for or against these uh, companies. And of course, opinions uh, may belong to me and not to neededly um, ENW. So let's start with the anamnesis section, the environment. Um, okay, I've got a medical background, so I will just tell you why vulnerabilities and devices in healthcare um, can somehow be compared to IoT devices, but why they can't, or why they can't even be compared to normal devices. It's uh, because of the environment, of course. So um, have delivery organizations, how we call uh, all the things like um, your doctor's office or a hospital. Um, they are, of course, highly specialized because they have one purpose and it's delivering healthcare and not making money, of course. And this brings some different things with it. So we have various audiences of people like patients, uh, the patient's families, of course, practitioners, nurses, all the different people having their expectations on the IT systems and devices, of course. And we have not some special workers that are operating some uh, high fidelity devices in a production lane or something. So we have many different people using the same systems, for example. And we have uh, some ancient processes. They are mostly paper-based and being digitized at, at the moment. So we have uh, the problem of many, many different systems being um, pulled up at the moment and, and being uh, built up in, in the hospitals and healthcare, healthcare delivery organizations. Of course, we have one purpose, delivering care. So operations is key. And this brings uh, some um, problems with it because, um, of course, health delivery organizations rely on the health records to provide their um, health, so, uh, health um, services. So when they don't have inf um, access to their information about the patients, of course, they cannot exclude any um, medication um, things that could harm a patient. So um, may basically, we have another problem so because uh, healthcare is behind other industries and protecting their infrastructure, which means um, they are hardly coping with keeping up the operations of their IT systems. So there is uh, somehow 
only a limited way to have some operational or strategical um, thinking or development in the IT systems. And this uh, also brings up another problem that they rely on out of the technology because devices may have been operated for 30 or 40 years even. So just think about a device being vulnerable in 2019 being still operated in 2050. This is uh, yeah, one problem of what uh, they are, have to cope with. And um, of course, the adoption of digital health records is bringing another huge impact in these things because um, if you're just interconnecting all the devices that weren't designed to be interconnected with each other, this is basically a um, total failure of all the security mechanisms that weren't designed at all. We have another problem that manufacturers push the security prob problems um, to the provider, which means you bought the system as a, a health HDO and you are integrating it in your IT systems landscape, so you are responsible for integrating it uh, securely which uh, is a bad joke, I think, because as a manufacturer, they have to provide security for their devices and not the, the users that are using it, of course. But uh, often they are pushing the security problems to the provider and this poses other interesting things. As we have seen with WannaCry, for example, there were security assessments of the infrastructures um, in uh, England and basically none of the tested trusts <laughs> had passed the security audit prior to the attack and the impact, of course, was huge. So. 34, trust, uh, 34 of the trusts in England have had uh, service interruptions and also over 1,000 um, diagnostic equipment uh, devices were uh, infected or is isolated. So basically you have two um, things to cause a denial of service with this attack, that um, equipment being uh, infected first and equipment being isolated from the network, which uh, means that you have an MRI scan, but you cannot send the results to the practitioner on the other side of the hospital to have, um, psych to have some diagnostics or um, to review these results. So basically, these are two points of the, um, denial of services that had a huge impact in, in the NHS. So around about 7,000 appointments were cancelled and 130 um, patient, uh, patient cancer uh, referrals were cancelled, which means there have been 139 patients that had a diagnosis of uh, cancer but the diagnostics to uh, prove this uh, diagnose couldn't have been done. So they had to wait another week or two weeks to being uh, sure or unsure if they really have cancer. I think that's uh, not acceptable <laughs> at all. So how is this uh, at the moment in Germany? The German Federal Office for Information Security releases uh, an annual report about the state of the IC security in Germany. And there also was a section about healthcare and it's saying that um, more, more smart devices are marketed every year, of course, because uh, the dig digitization of the healthcare, of course, is increasing. But also with these uh, increasing uh, smart devices, attacks with potential patient threats increase, which means having more and more insecure medical devices marketed, of course, increases the risk of a patient being harmed by such a device. Um, the key observation of this, of course, um, was some basic uh, security level missing because uh, weak authentication mechanisms or missing authentication mechanisms and, of course, um, encryption being self-implemented or uh, not implemented at all. So the things, I think, normal um, devices in industries like uh, the automotive industries don't have these problems since the 90s anymore. Of course, the BSE is also saying operations is key, so you cannot just add security to all these devices and render them unusable anymore. Because, of course, um, a practitioner in a surgery cannot input a 16 charge password with a keyboard having on gloves or using a touchscreen or such a thing. So we have to keep in mind that the environment demands for operational functionality and medical functionality, of course. Then we have, of course, statistics from Germany because the German Federal Office for Drugs and Medications um, is collecting all risk reportings because it's the name authority in this thing in Germany and it's publishing these things. And we can see that there are 13,000 um, risk reports every year of medical devices posing risks to patients that could have been harmed or killed by this, which means uh, that only half of these are active medical devices, which means the other things is something like surgical equipment or plasters or something like this. But active medical devices are basically what we understand about uh, Medizingeräte in German or medical devices. 
So this means that 20 reports a day pose risks to patients, which means also that about 20 patients a day could have been killed by medical devices that are insecure. I only want to add that we have to be um, careful about interpret interpreting these statistics because uh, there may be some selection bias because everyone is just uh, causing awareness in this region. So there may be even um, a surgeon that has no uh, problem in publishing these reports, but he has other problems when in the surgery device isn't working anymore. He doesn't want to have his patient killed, of course. So often this in the past uh, may not be reported at all, and nowadays may be reported. So this doesn't needingly uh, imply that the risk is increasing by interpreting this. But you have to investigate in this more. So let's go, go to the regulations uh, that are in place in the European Union, for example. And uh, first of all, we have to define what is a medical device at all and how are they being classified in their risk level. So um, in the U European U Economic Area, directives uh, regulate this depending on the primary intended use by the manufacturer. So if a device is really used for delivering health services or is it uh, used for some um, tracking of sportive activities, for example, because then it's no medical device. And also, depending on the possible harm this, uh, this device may pose to patients. So if it's just measuring uh, values, for example, or is it uh, giving a treatment like linear accelerators or something like this, where you, of course, can harm patients directly. Depending on this, uh, manufacturers must implement additional um, risk and management processes and have also uh, to give this documentation for certification purposes. But this doesn't needingly include cybersecurity at the moment, only safety. So what is a medical device? Basically, that's the original uh, definition, but I want to abbreviate this because it's basically everything that is uh, for diagnosis of diseases, of treatments, or um, control of conception. So basically everything you are um, automatically thinking of a medical device. Additionally, software also may be a medical device as it's used for these purposes. And also there's a huge discussion about mobile apps and fitness trackers. Are they medical devices? Should we have a certification for them or should we require them to be certified? But um, I think the discussion is being torn away at the moment because um, there's some more emotional uh, discussion than fact-based discussion at the moment, so we have to be careful talking about, about this at the moment. But um, basically, they are considered software as a medical device, so they, in my opinion, need certification. And it's, I think, more interesting what Apple was doing last year. They introduced health records in iOS for the veterans in the US. And of course, they published the Apple Watch Series 4 with the ECG sensor, which I'm also um, examining. But Poorly, it isn't certified in European economic area for using this sensor. But the interesting thing at this is that not the hardware is being certified, so not the Apple Watch has a certification. It's only the two apps that are measuring the values using the hardware. Um, if you're interested in this, I put two links into the slides where you can see the original um, request for certification of Apple and the FDA. So um, you can investigate in this if you have fun in reading uh, free pages of uh, loyal things. <laughs> it's mostly not technical and not uh, that really understandable, I think. Okay, um, this will somehow change in 2020 because we have the medical device uh, regulation in, uh, in the European Union, which will uh, supersede some nation-specific uh, regulations like the Medizinproduktegesetz in Germany or some other um, things and uh, regulations that are um, from the ice scene of the European Union not, union not um, opti optimal. So implications of this regulation is that all medical devices are being classified more strictly, which also implies that there's more documentation and effort to be taken for software as a medical device. And also that there have to be implemented some measures against basic cybersecurity risks, which imposes, of course, an um, intense E4 for uh, medical device manufacturers. But I think that's the basic things they should be doing right now. They should also be doing right now. So um, we will see what happens in May 2020 because this thing is also effective since May 2017. I think uh, we saw what happens with uh, regulations being effective and 
uh, two weeks before um, the old ones are being uh, cancelled um, with the GDPR. So <laughs> I'm really tuned what's happening because that's roughly one year and you basically need one, half about a year for a certification of your device. So if you want to have your device certified until May uh, 25th, 27, um, basically you have to be um, applying for the certification until um, October or something like this. When everyone is doing, of course, it's a denial of service of the public authorities, but that's another thing. So let's come to the diagnostics, um, the hands-on on the medical devices. Um, before we are talking about the vulnerabilities, we of course have to say that defects in medical devices are very sensitive because publishing zero days in medical devices poses a huge risk to patients. You may even kill somebody with this when some uh, you know, layman is trying out the exploit, for example, and is uh, unintentionally killing a patient in a hospital, for example. So you should, of course, very well thought out and have some very um, thought out disclosure with this, mostly with for example, public authorities that um, require the uh, certifications or also review the certifications. But also you don't want to conceal these vulnerabilities because the users, of course, have to estimate the risks for themselves. They have to implement pre preliminary uh, mitigations for uh, reducing the risks. But um, it's not that easy to handle this, so we have to be careful, of course. But what I de I'm demanding is a public chronology on which all these measures and vulnerabilities, of course, are documented in a transparent way for, way for um, secondary users of these devices being able to estimate the risks, of course, and also to reduce that uh, block black box thing of the medical devices that you are knowing which software is running in this thing, because mostly this is the secret of the manufacturer at the moment. Another uh, question is where do I get information about vulnerabilities, of course, because uh, only a few researchers or security researchers have access to real medical devices because they are mostly expensive. And um, I think do, you don't want to spend uh, 6 million euros for an MRI, for example, just to have uh, some little research for two weeks on this, and then it's broken, for example. <laughs> so there are central... Um, that's a central analysis and evaluation of these risks by the authorities that also um, review these um, certifications. And this means that um, in Germany, this is, of course, the Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices, where we also saw the statistics before. And in the US, it's the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. So all laws, they are very similar to each other. So what we saw as a definition for medical device in the European Union is basically the same in the US. They don't differ in this, they differ in the things they demand for certification, but they are being harmonized at the moment. So um, you have to report risks that you uh, had in your hospital, for example, and you're forced by this uh, by law. You have to do this. As security researchers, we have the possibility to do so, but we don't need to, which means we have uh, we can have uh, clean disclosures and then reporters, for example, or have uh, the bee farm, for example, uh, disclosing this. Another thing is um, that the manufacturer, of course, will not publish this information because they, of course, will not endanger their market position at the moment, uh, re revealing that their devices are vulnerable, of course. So um, there are other interesting sources like the SES cert in the US, which even publishes CVE numbers, uh, the complete descriptions of the vulnerabilities, including risk estimations, mitigations, and uh, they force uh, manufacturers to um, also update this information with their mitigations they're implementing. And since 2018, also the German authorities try to improve the situation by recommendations or uh, public um, funded research. Such an um, uh, advisory looks like this. If you want to investigate in these things, uh, search for ICSMA. This, this M is for medical because the ICSA advisories, of course, are all the things that are also um, published for other industries. So that M is specific for the medical devices. And as you can see with this, there are some kind of strange vulnerabilities in healthcare like having uh, access to the memory of device using HTTP cookies. I never saw this before, but uh, I think interesting how this even can happen. Another thing is 
the update things. I do not really know if you can read this because it's a, it's a bad photo, but um, that's a device that hasn't had updates for three years. And it's vulnerable to Turner Blue, of course, at the moment, and uh, at least to this. And also we have seen some ultrasound scanner that hasn't seen updates for 10 years. So that's completely normal in healthcare at the moment. And um, if you're just investigating in normal vulnerabilities, if nobody uh, really misses patching, you can see things like unreasonable config configurations. I think on the first spot, you can spot uh, the wrong values on the right, but um, the implication of this is that your normal heart rate, of, of course, is between zero and uh, normally not zero, but zero and 180 maybe. But this device is only alerting if you are having 30,583 beats per minute, quite a lot, I think, or minus 30,500. So basically, this device is useless being uh, in, in alerting uh, the medical staff about uh, your health or beats per minute of your heart. So other systems are, <laughs> that are being used in radi uh, radiology, for example, is an image uh, information system. Uh, which mostly run as Windows 7, the new ones maybe only uh, uh, also on Windows 10, but they have some special user account for the manufacturer to patch and also somehow for um, the medical staff because they don't create new accounts for all the people. It's too much work for them. Too much work. <clears throat> we know how we can solve this, but uh, it's too much work for the medical thing, uh, staff. So um, they have this uh, general user account and have the software installed on this where they use their domain credentials. And the vulnerability in this case was that the software locked all these domain credentials into a log file that was word readable, readable from all the users. So basically you only needed access to the operating system which was on the posted on the screen of course. And then you could just extract credentials from all the people having logged in in the system. And of course, you can use these credentials to access other systems in the whole hospital because these are the LDAP credentials or RD credentials of all the users. So it's a total compromise of the infrastructure basically by locking these credentials. And of course, you can also change device configuration data by using um, the high privileged credentials of um, the medical staff, for example, that is allowed to configure an MRI, for example. So um, yeah. This workstation was also unpatched, so basically you even could remote exploit this by the using the Turner Blue exploit, because this system, of course, was um, accessible from other parts of the hospital. Our next target is an infusion pump, which uh, delivers nutrition and medications to patients. Um, you may have seen this uh, in intensive care units, for example. Um, the vulnerability in this case uh, it's shocking, I think, but we will come to this later. Um, the thing in intensive care is that you have multiple units, of course, and that you have multiple rooms with multiple patients. So, and you have maybe only a limited uh, amount of staff to um, care about these patients. And so you have a controlling unit where you can see all the values from all these devices and can control them, push new um, medications, also push new uh, libraries about these things, updates. So you can do all this remotely, having a, a network where they are all in. So and the vulnerability, of course, was an unauthenticated Telnet port um, with an empty password. You had root access by just finding it. And I think um, this is unacceptable because you can all, uh, also find all these pumps in the network by just doing a, a small NMAP scan. As this is possible for laymen to find these things and to shut down all the infusion pumps in an intensive care unit. This even kills patients. Another target is an MRI, which uh, I preferably would say is the coolest uh, test that we have performed because these huge devices costing millions of uh, euros and also the impact of these devices that you aren't allowed to take any metals in the room and that thing, I think that's very impressive to see the technology and also to know how this technology works. But um, having an arch architectural view, view of this thing, um, you have the MRI with the coils and all that uh, magnetic thing, uh, the helium things and so. And you have uh, the controlling unit. This is controlling all the magnetic fields and is um, doing the hardware stuff, for example. Then you have a Linux uh, server that is um, accepting all the measured values and is calculating the images. So you basically have um, 
in 15 minutes measuring two terabytes of raw data, and this Linux server is calculating four gigabytes of images out of it, for example. So this is very complex and very um, calculation intensive, so uh, you need uh, very high uh, resources for this. And so it's separated, separated separation of concerns looks, looks that good, I, I think, but also it has a, a large uh, HGT, of course. So you have a host PC for the medical staff that's saying, okay, we have patient XY and he's, we should um, review or do um, a scan of this part of his body. So um, the WeXWorks station is uh, knowing which parameters it has to use for the coils. So what we first saw on the host PC was uh, this thing, no firewall, no automatic updates, no virus protection. Why is this in this case uh, normal? Because um, you get all these free systems sold by the manufacturer. So you are not allowed to do anything on any of these devices or you're avoiding warranty, of course. And then you are liable for all the problems of these devices. So you do not want to do this. So the manufacturer has to patch it. That's why we don't have automatic updates, of course, because you need to have them tested. And if you're just port scanning uh, the systems, I have never seen 140 ports uh, before on a system, but mostly 90 of them were being used by transferring the huge amounts of data to the host PC. Because if you're transferring uh, two gigabytes of data and want to scroll this live, it's kind of impressive how it even works, but uh, you need in a huge amount of ports to have this data flown. Um, yeah, the bad thing of the port scan, <laughs> we even crashed that thing, I think. Have you ever seen um, a, a huge device, device that costs billions of dollars or euros crashing with a simple end-up scan? I have never seen this before. But of course, the memory dump also included um, sensitive patient data. And um, yeah, I think that's also a total failure. So we just broke the host PC. Uh, then we encountered uh, that the Linux system has also a root root as a credential set, and this also applies for the VxWorks <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, but that's not the last thing we encountered because we could access this thing from the patient's Wi-Fi. So uh, network segmentation wasn't in place too, or the firewall routes were misconfigured. So uh, I think this is a completely total failure of all the things you could have in a hospital. Also, we are doing a medical device pen tests, so therefore we also have some collections of statements from the manufacturers when we found some vulnerabilities and ask ourselves how it even is possible to have these things implemented. And somehow they were saying, yeah, um, we only need to have uh, some authorization mechanisms and then we are fine. So basically, no. <laughs> Um, the other thing is our device will only be operated in secure environments, so the typically pushing it to the provider thing. Um, of course, they have to provide secure devices, but um, that's another thing. And we don't know what we are go going to do with the network plug machine. It came with the board we used. So basically, they are also using uh, pre-built uh, hardware parts, which is fully acceptable, I think, if they would do hardening of these things. So um, yeah, the system cannot be patched because we need to get a certification first. This somehow applies if they're vulnerable but increasing security levels does not need to have a recertification. So they can patch it any time. That's not the problem because they only have to recertify their systems um, if they are increasing the feature set, for example, or if they identify new risks, for example. But simple patching is uh, not only allowed, they have to do this. That's my favorite. We know that Telnet is insecure, so we implemented a custom Telnet command interpreter. Of course, we found an LCE in it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, knowing Telnet, the same guy said, if we do not use encryption, we can't do it wrong. So uh, yes, basically, that's one finding in the report. If they're doing it wrong, they maybe have three findings. So it's a simple, uh, it's a simple calculation for them, but I think you cannot hold this uh, for reality. It's, I cannot understand this. And of course, the last thing we always hear, a hacker can always find a way, but that's no argument for insecure devices, in my opinion. So, but that's reality, of course. So let's go to the three section, sections, some recommendations, and also um, our future um, research thing. Um, the FDA, of course, is uh, doing much about cybersecurity, much than the European uh, authorities at the moment, but this is an increasing um, 
thing at the moment. So the FDA is saying that manufacturers are responsible, responsible for ensuring the security of the medical devices, which is fine. And they also have to review it in the life cycle of the device, not just before having access to the market, also while having access to the markets. They have to remain vigilant about these things. But also it's saying that the HDOs, of course, have to secure their environments, which means that this is a shared responsibility of all these parties, which is fine, I think. So the FDA also released a, a new draft of a yeah, document that says how to pass certification reviews. And this was um, redefined last year, and it was, um, it's currently a draft, so it's not to be applied at the moment, but um, it has many changes, not even that it's not uh, three pages long anymore, but 21 pages, I think. So it's much more about cybersecurity, of course. And uh, the differences, the main differences are that they, uh, as the medical device manufacturers, have to provide a much more detailed architecture and device uh, and de design um, documentation for their devices being reviewed. So they are also demanding for more information, not having this black box anymore with the risk analysis, for example. And also um, it's saying that it's a short, uh, shared responsibility. So the users should be in place to review the risks of a device before being used. And also the risks have to be assessed during the whole life cycle. So the FDA is not saying that the manufacturers have to use this, but they are saying that it's more likely to pass the recertification if you use it. So basically follow this as a manufacturer and you're fine. Also it demands for a nice thing which is called cybersecurity bill of materials. Some of you may know a software bill of materials. This is basically the same thing, but with a focus on cybersecurity. So it's also listing all the software and hardware that is being used in the device. And this is published for the users so they can see, oh, this device is using this library in this version. And if there is a feed about vulnerabilities for this library, of course, they can themselves estimate that there are risks imposing from this, from this device and can isolate it, for example, before an infection, of course, occurs, of course. So they can understand the potential impact of a vulnerability. And also this mainly reduces the black box uh, property of a medical device. So we're fine with this, I think. Also, there is uh, the security recommendation by the German Federal Office for Information Security, which was published in May last year. And it's uh, basically saying similar things, but the FDA's, um, the FDA's recommendations are based on tiers that they define, so on the criticali criticality of the, uh, the risk of the devices, basically. And the BSE is, um, defining this by the mode of operation. We will come to this on the next slide, but um, this is also meant to be a, co a company for the regulatory uh, requirements of the devices because the BSE basically has not, is not involved in the certification process because um, that's another department. That's uh, the German Office for Health, Federal Office for Health, but, uh, or, or the B-Farm, for example. But the ES BSE is somehow uh, in, in closer communication with these authorities. So um, basically the other ones are demanding for applying this or using this. The modes of um, operation I also talked about is that a device that has a risk um, estimation at the moment must not only be secure when being operated. So when measuring, um, measuring um, health record um, values, for example, but also when updates are applied, because many of the devices we are always uh, also seeing um, don't have any signed updates, for example, or you can easily temper the updates or such things. So um, manufacturers should ensure that also the configuration thing of the device is secure, which is interesting because I think the FDA is not saying this with these words, but um, that's um, a more complete thing of viewing the different angles of the device, I think, the modes by seeing the modes of operations. operations, And also, this is some kind of distinction of uh, the people that are using the device and their backgrounds. So I think this is fine. And also, of course, 
It's saying that security measures must not have a negative impact on the safety functions of the device. So you're not allowed or you should not uh, add security mechanisms just by having them implemented without thinking on the implications of the safety of the device. So there's something that is called um, breaking glass scenario, for example, for health records. So in the case of an emergency, you must be able to access health information without the consent of the patient to being able to help them, of course. So, and this is from a cybersecurity perspective, interesting to have this applied on these devices, for example, or on the records. And it's also not solved at the moment, I think, <laughs> from a security perspective. So, we're coming to the outlook and future research uh, part of my talk. Um, there are a few topics that weren't discussed in the past, like risk rating in medical for medical devices. So as an example, if you're having an information disclosure in a web app or something, this mostly is not that highly rated because it has not that huge impact without some uh, vulnerability chain uh, leveraging some other vulnerabilities, for example. But having uh, disclosed some sensitive patient information like uh, diagnosis is a huge impact, of course, and this currently is not being um, reflected by the CVSS rating, for example. So the Mitre, for example, um, published this in October, I think, and they try to uh, guide you through rating medical device vulnerabilities using CVSS by demanding some other rating um, things uh, when rating. So. This currently also is a draft, but uh, I wanted to add this for you when you want to review it, for example, but also there are some new rating systems uh, developed. I found this one, for example, that is trying to achieve the same thing with another um, starting point. But um, this is still a huge discussion in the community because um, how do you communicate vulnerabilities if you cannot rate them accordingly to the risks they really pose? to the patients because this is no industry system for which uh, CVSS, for example, was uh, defined. So the impacts are totally different and therefore this needs to be redefined. And also, I am uh, giving many talks in the medical community that are mostly laymen for technical things like some conferences of um, uh, radiologists, for example, or I'm talking in Berlin in a few weeks um, on a medical informatics um, ferry. But um, I think we as security researchers, of course, have to raise awareness in the communities we are re researching in because the users, of course, have to be aware of security risks to be able to mitigate things in these devices when they are published. So. What I would like to have is that uh, the medical staff that, of course, um, has a, is maybe the, the main use uh, staff of these devices, of course, um, is aware that they should not trust this device 100%, um, that they should always think about the plausibility of what the device is saying and also rechecking what it's doing until they are they can't be sure that this device isn't compromised at the moment. So um, raising awareness is a big point we are also doing at ENW. That's another thing. We had a public um, tender from the German Federal Office of Formation Security and won that uh, tender. So we're having the project MoneyMate, which is basically about uh, pen testing medical devices and doing some research on um, which devices are marketed in the European Union or in Germany in the last five years, for example. And uh, the German Federal Office for Information Security then selects some devices, around about 10 devices, and we are testing them from a security perspective, ex estimating the risks and uh, writing this in a way that uh, laymen in the population can understand which problems these devices have in general. So uh, an abstracted way to um, assess the security of these devices, but of course, high technically in depth. But this will, I think, somehow be published too. So this project is planned for one and a half years and it will be starting um, next month, I think. So we had to kick off last Friday. So <laughs> really confident about this project. Also, we wrote um, 
uh, white paper last year. I think it was also published in May. If you want uh, to see some more examples of insecure devices or more things, or learn, to more, learn more things about the environment, um, we described it in this paper a little more in, more in detail. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention at the moment. In case of risks and side effects, of course, please consult your doctor, maybe ask him for his vulnerabilities in his systems, for his uh, environments.